Good morning. Welcome back to the second day of the uh, uh, Tripologic Symposium. We had a great day yesterday. Um, a lot of uh, good content. Um, some of the sessions were recorded. Um, I haven't tried it out yet, but I was told that if you go back um, and click on the link, you can see um, the recorded videos. And one of them um, is our keynote speaker, who was um, Admiral uh, Bobby Ray Inman, former uh, Dernza of NSA. So I would encourage you if you didn't get a chance yesterday morning to go and check that out. Um, this is session 7B, Cryptology and Prisoners of War. And during the session, we're going to hear from two speakers, uh, Mr. Peter Bedini on the MISX code section, supporting escape and evasion in World War II. And also Mr. Greg Nedved, Chinese POWs in Korea and understanding Chinese cryptology. I think both of these are gonna be really interesting. And um, if you'd like more information, there are full bios and abstracts of their presentations available in the attendee packet that you all should have received with the final program. <coughs> Questions will be submitted through the uh, Q&A chat box. Um, so anytime during the presentation, if you have a question, uh, please put it in there. We will hold questions until the end of the presentation. Please indicate which speaker the question is directed at uh, so that we can ask that question. Um, and if we run out of time, um, I'll gather the remaining questions and send those off um, to the speakers. So without further ado, I'm going to send it over to Peter Bedini uh, for his uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, happy to be here this morning to give an overview of a little known top secret program that the Army ran during World War II. It was called MISX. It was based uh, just south of DC along the Potomac River. It operated globally in all theaters of the war and its purpose was to facilitate evasion and escape by US prisoners of war uh, during World War II. Uh, I have a keen interest in this subject, and part of the reason is my father, Silvio Bedini, was the chief cryptologist of MISX code section during World War II. Uh, to his great credit and to my great dismay, he never shared any details about what he did there for about three or four years. Um, so uh, I had to gather information from other sources. Um, before World War I, prisoners were largely thought of almost as board pieces in a game where once captured, they're set aside and no longer players in the game. And the realization that POWs could actually make very meaningful and substantial contributions came roughly around World War I, in particular with the British. Prisoners were managing to escape on their own accord. Some of them used homegrown codes to share information uh, with the homeland, and, and so that that was useful, but without an organized program or reliable communication system with the war office, they were haphazard. Um, much could be learned by reading the record of these exploits uh, that came out after the war, and a couple of the most popular ones are shown here. A.J. Evans was an escapee, and he wrote The Escaping Club, and then Harrison and Cartwright wrote uh, Within Four Walls, and, and there are others. Uh, so in the uh, lead up to World War II, the British decided they, they needed a formal escape and evasion program. And they based it on the work of uh, Rawlinson, who was working in MI1A, and Holland, who was working in MIR. MI1A was looking a very small effort to look into leveraging prisoners of war, both British and enemy. And uh, MIR was looking at irregular operations, as they called it. Uh, it later merged with a couple other efforts and became the SOE, the Special Operatives uh, Executive. Um, but they took these, the work of these two folks that was applicable and um, merged it together and became MI9, which was formally established just before Christmas in 1939 to facilitate E&E &E by British POWs. Uh, once the US joined the war, it was clear that the number of POWs would increase substantially. Uh, they would face the same conditions and challenges and collaborating with MI9 would strengthen both efforts. Uh, the top secret MISX effort was established in October of 42 to facilitate E&E &E for US POWs. Uh, it benefited greatly from MI9's generosity in sharing their lessons learned uh, 
uh, their codes, uh, their processes, and so they really collaborated very well together. Uh, here's a picture of Norm Crockett, uh, Brigadier. He was the head of MI9. He had been in World War I in infantry. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ed Johnston is his counterpart at MISX. He actually became quite wealthy as an executive and heir to the R.J. Reynolds Foundation, but um, he was, uh, these two worked very closely together throughout the, the whole effort. So MISX was established at Fort Hunt, Virginia. It's about 12 miles south of the Pentagon. I'm showing it here along the river uh, in the bottom left. Uh, it was already the home to the MISY Top Secret Interrogation Center, where they were uh, interrogating, uh, interviewing, and not using torture, by the way, uh, to get information from the uh, German and Italian officers that had been uh, captured. And these efforts were separate. And for the most part, those working in one did not know that the other one even existed. Um, my father is a little exception because he got to Fort Hunt a little early for MISX and he spoke Italian. So they, they put him over in MISY for a while. Um, MISX is commonly referred to by its address, which is the Post Office Box 1142. And it was organized into five sections. Training uh, was briefing servicemen on E&E &E and code work. Interviewing was debriefing servicemen after they were liberated, if they were POWs. Uh, the camp conditions was a very important section to compile any information, especially about the location of the camps, so that the Allies would avoid bombing them by mistake in, in their sorties. Uh, the technical created an astonishingly wide variety of escape aids and ways of concealing them and sending them to the POWs. And uh, code and correspondence, of course, established the underlying system of communi communication between a POWs and the MISX folks. Um, just to take a little digression on the escape aids, uh, the kinds of things that were concealed is, are remarkable. The compasses was the most uh, widespread, all sorts of sizes, tiny uh, to, to larger. Uh, maps, currency, uh, silk maps, forged papers, uh, wire saws, wire cutters, files, dyes, civilian clothes, radio components, and uh, even handguns in at least one incident. Um, they set up two fake charitable organizations, Servicemen's Relief and the War Prisoners Benefit Foundation, and they were the sole two organizations used to uh, send this contraband into the camps. They were very careful to avoid uh, implicating the Red Cross in any way. They didn't want to jeopardize its operations, so they were never used. Uh, here are a couple x-rays on the bottom left. You can see that the smaller ball, the baseball, has a big cavity in it which uh, could have radio parts or compasses or any sort of thing that would fit into it. Uh, these pipes, which are very typical of the pipes that were used uh, during that period, you can see they have cavities in them. Uh, you could roll up some currency and put them in, or most commonly little compasses were put into pipes. And in this, this is a game board, um, very often Monopoly, chess, checkers, backgammon. Uh, they would put these cavities in it so that if they were breaking up, broken apart, you could have silk maps or forged papers or e even other large things in them. And MI9 did uh, all of this. Uh, MISX did its own. Uh, they, they did uh, trade uh, objects early on and then uh, ways to do things. And MISX ended up doing some things MI9 didn't uh, and vice versa. The code and, communi code and correspondence section, it, it, it was alternately called the code section, the correspondence section, the code and correspondence section. So I, I just call it the code section here for the most part. Uh, they received intelligence about camp locations and conditions, uh, military intelligence of strategic importance about where factories were or how people were, uh, different servicemen were shot down. Um, pr they provided information to the POWs on preferred or dangerous escape routes, and they alerted POWs of incoming loaded parcels, meaning um, look out for this particular parcel because it has escape aids in it. And you'll see a reference to that later. Uh, and in following MI9's lead, the code section focused first on letter codes, which uh, hid messages in correspondence that the POWs were sending uh, to fa family and friends. <clears throat> Uh, that was a reliable mechanism because Germany actually ratified the Geneva Convention. And so uh, they were obliged to let the POWs have a certain number of letters and postcards home every month. 
Uh, Japan did not ratify the Geneva Convention, so they were not bound by that. And it was a lot spottier. Sometimes Japan would allow messages to be sent out, but not as regularly or reliably as the Germans by any means. Uh, this is a, a map of Fort Hunt. Uh, the Potomac River is to the bottom right here. Uh, the big rectangular area in the middle is their parade ground. On the bottom, you can see a POW enclosure, and there are more of those off the picture to the left. Um, but most of what uh, MISX was doing uh, were in two buildings. This is the creamery, uh, no longer there. Uh, it was an old building that pre-existed the war. And that's where my father and, and the rest of the uh, code uh, section worked. Uh, they built a new building across the street that was referred to as the warehouse. And that's where all the things were built and you know, ways of concealment were developed and, and such. So between those two buildings, the vast majority of the work was being done. Um, just for chuckles, here's a picture of my father with a couple of his colleagues uh, outside in, in front of the, the creamery. Um, the letter codes are actually concealment ciphers. They're called codes. I'm going to generically use the word code. Uh, they're, they're concealment ciphers. They depend on the rearrangement of letters of a plain text message and incorporation of them into a seemingly innocent letter or correspondence. They were very simple in concept, uh, but they, they proved to be very, very secure and economical because you could put substantial messages within just one page or so of, of a message home. It was important that the final correspondence didn't arouse any suspicion, um, certainly by the German censors, but also by the US censors because they didn't know uh, what was going on. And uh, it was a very, very secret uh, operation. Uh, they had to be easy to learn because the, the servicemen were often taught very quickly and not completely. And uh, they came from varying educational backgrounds. And frankly, they're under a lot of stress when they have to uh, uh, then determine how to send messages home. Uh, and, and when they had to decipher and encipher, they were under uh, scrutiny by the German guard. So they had to try to do it without worksheets if possible. And they had to eat or burn the worksheets if, if that wasn't possible. And the systems were uh, had to be conformed to the US and the enemy uh, letter forms. Here's one on the left that is um, uh, blank and it's a US form. And you can see it folds up and then the address is put on it. Similarly, the German one in the middle is about the same size and, and form. And then a, a German postcard is on the bottom and to the right is one of the pieces of paper that were used by the Japanese. Although they also had a postcard uh, where they limited the number of words allowed to 25. To establish code correspondence in all of the many POW camps, but maintain security, they tried to limit the number of uh, users instructed to less than or about 10% of any one battle unit. And to further limit liability, they used more than one code so that if the code were compromised, there'd still be um, correspondence going on. The intelligence officers in the unit were asked to identify candidates for code use, and they were told not to worry about rank, just who's who's better suited for it. They favored people that like crossword puzzles or that uh, knew how to read music and things like that. Uh, the majority of the code users were in the Air Force because those were the ones going out front and most likely to be imprisoned at this stage in the war. Uh, the Army, Marines and Navy personnel were also trained and some other non-military organizations like the Counterintelligence Corps uh, were also um, trained. Uh, the MISX kept a register of all the code users trained, and then if any of those names showed up uh, as an MIA or POW, they were put on a special watch list. That watch list was also held and maintained at the censorship office in New York, and any mail going to or from someone on that list was immediately redirected to, to Fort Hunt. They didn't know why, but that's their order. Uh, a sample card is on the right. Uh, I blocked out the name, but on the top right, you can see this person was taught code number three and four. And code three requires a five letter word and code four requires a two digit ID that was unique to the user. And they would have been on this card as well. The correspondence to write to the POWs 
at the early stages of the war, they began with next of kin, which they called NOK. And uh, the code user's family member was vetted and then enlisted to help send and receive messages to the POW from MISX. The NOK would write a letter to the POW, send it to MISX, who would rewrite it to incorporate a hidden message, and then return it to the next of kin, who would then write it again on the proper stationery and the proper handwriting, and then send it off to the POW at that point. And then coming back the other way, uh, it was intercepted at, at censorship and sent to MI, uh, MISX, and they would simply photocopy it and then send it on to the next of kin. It became clear that that was a lot of back and forth and that they could save a lot of effort if they made alternative personalities or phonies. Uh, so they didn't involve the next of kin at all. They had a phony correspondent that uh, in that case, the letters were written at MISX only once, uh, but they had to pay a lot of attention to configuration control because they're making up names, they're making up full personas. They have certain stationery that they would try to keep using uh, in either handwriting or typewriting. Uh, they had to be careful to make it consistent. They were, they were very, very cautious and assumed the Germans would catch any little slip up. Uh, in retrospect, they might not have needed to be quite as cautious as they were, but they didn't know, so they were taking a lot of care. Um, full personas were developed. Uh, this is, <laughs> I spoke to the daughter of a code user a year or two ago, and she said that her father uh, corresponded with Lorraine, a woman named Lorraine, for about two years when he was imprisoned, and then when he got home and was debriefed, he met Lorraine, who was a uh, short, bald, middle-aged man with a mustache, <laughs> which kind of crashed his dreams a little bit. Um, also, this is interesting to me. This is a letter that, that my dad had. I didn't know why he had it because he didn't have a lot of these. But then if you look carefully, this, this POW is writing, Helen, I can't for the life of me place you, but you must know the family. Well, this is, I, I'm pretty sure what this is, is a code user who forgot his training because they were taught the code and then they were taught uh, they might get messages from somebody they've never heard before. And when that happens, it's un undoubtedly MISX sending them a message. And this guy just forgot that, was getting letters from Helen and liked them, but, but couldn't place her. Uh, this is a table of the British and the US codes used in World War II. Um, the British started with a dictionary code called HK, and that meant that the POW and the War Office had to have the same little English-German dictionary, and then it was important to point to a certain page or column or row and, and find out what the word of the message is. Uh, they switched to number two uh, in, I don't know, I think maybe even 41, and then they made number two, a little safer and easier to use, and it developed into, into code three. And that's the one they used primarily in the European theater of operation for the war. They did have a, a code five that they used exclusively for Colditz, that's OFLOG 4C. And then you can see they, they also used uh, some uh, with SOE, sent one for use by E Group in India. They, um, they, the first U.S. POWs uh, were caught before MISX started, so they were taught Code 3 by the British. So Code 3 was used by both uh, U.S. and uh, U.K. Uh, POWs. And then um, the British made Code 4 specifically for the U.S. use and then later Code 12. So uh, a little later in the war, you still have people using code three if they hadn't been repatriated yet, but then most of the new people that starting in late 40, well, I think, yeah, late 42, uh, early 43 were, were using code four. And MISX taught that code. It was developed by MI9, but MISX taught it to the servicemen. The MISX folks developed many systems for use in the ETO, as well as the Asian theaters. Uh, and it wasn't known then how reliable the com correspondence would be with Japan. It, it turned out to be very unreliable, and there is not a lot of record of having codes successfully sent uh, home from Japan. Uh, not that many letters, as a matter of fact. Um, the MISX codes were also used uh, extensively for operational use. They had uh, stations in every theater of operation. They had in Southwest Pacific, the Pacific Ocean area, China, Burma, India, North Africa, 
um, and various, various other places, the Mediterranean. And so they had the, the people working for MISX all around the world were communicating with each other by letter and using their own codes. Um, <clears throat> Here you also see reference to 25 word codes in looking at number seven, eight and 10 over on the MISX side. Uh, that's because of the Japanese limiting the number of, of words to uh, 25 and the codes were made specifically to be sending a message in that small number of words. Uh, number nine was interesting because it lent itself to being used in different uh, languages. So they had developed that as well. And I don't know to what extent they were used in other languages. I know it was extensively used operationally by MISX. And then on the bottom under other, I've got a series of codes. I don't really know to what extent they used them all. I think the, the C series was for CBI, the China, Burma, India. And the E series, I believe, were a couple codes that helped uh, introduce code use to a camp that didn't have a code user, and that was done in Stalag 2B as an example. Uh, in all, MISX taught almost 10,000 uh, codes to almost 10,000 um, users. Uh, they, they taught some users more than one, which is why that number is greater than the code users. So it's roughly nine to 10,000 people were, were taught just by MISX during the war. Uh, here's a sample letter code. Um, it uh, is code number three. Uh, it was widely used by both, as I said. It was created by CWR Hooker of the Foreign Office and then developed further by MI9. It requires a five letter code word without repeated letters. Uh, in this example, uh, the gentleman is writing home a seemingly innocuous letter to, uh, I think it's his wife, uh, and it, it, contained, his, it contained a message. His code word was nymph five letters. Uh, the message was that another POW named D.C. Howard <coughs> was now sending codes using his own code word, could. And this allowed MISX to begin corresponding separately to Howard using the word could. Now, the way he, he conveys that is uh, to decode it, <coughs> excuse me, MI9, MISX would have to make this grid that's roughly three by nine which is 27, which is all the 26 letters plus one other, uh, which is a zero, and that indicates the end of the whole message. So you put the word nymph in the corner, you start in the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, and in the middle. That's how you put the five letters of the code word. Then you complete the alphabet after that, starting with the N. So you go to O, you skip the Y, uh, <coughs> you skip the P because it's in the word nymph, and you have Q, R, S, T, U, V, et cetera. Um, all the letters are in there. They're jumbled now, uh, driven by which specific code word was used and how it was placed. Then you go and you look at the, just the letter uh, itself, and it starts with, I got your welcome and extremely speedy letter. Um, you look at the first letters of each uh, word in groups of three, and you look at which column they fall in. So I got your is I-G-Y, if you look down at the bottom. And that I is in the first column, and the G and the Y are in the third column. So you write down one, three, three. And then uh, welcome and extremely is W A E, and that turns out to be a one, three, one. And if you look in the table at 133, you see it's an M, and 131, you see, is an E. So this is how the message slowly comes out of the letter. Uh, the reason it starts with ME is that at this time they were numbering their code messages home and they would use an M for message and then a letter indicating which letter it was. So this is the fifth letter that this guy wrote. And then the message that follows, excuse me, is uh, DC Howard. And then you see a Z come up and you look at uh, Day of Merriment and you have DOM and that turns out to be a three. 2, 1, and 3, 2, 1 is a Z. Well, in this code, Z means, okay, now use the next word in the message, uh, in, the, in, the, in the letter, uh, as it is. So after day of merriment, you get a Z, so you use the word using. Then you start again with all conceivable methods, ACM, and you see that that's another Z, so that means you use the next word after that, and that happens to be could. 
So you've got a message now. You know, it's the fifth message this guy wrote. He's saying that DC Howard is now using could as a code word. That's just one example using code three, and that's exactly the kind of message, uh, many different types of messages, but this is one that was important to be sure all the users are, are understood and registered by the, by the uh, war office or war department. As far as the communication pipeline, um, a POW's family member drafts a letter to the POW and sends it to MISX, as I said. The code section rewrites it and sends it back to uh, the next of kin. Next of kin copies it uh, carefully and sends it straight to the POW, but it goes to New York and is pulled by the censorship office. There is a liaison office in New York where a couple of the MISX folks in plain clothes uh, operated. So they were censorship office knew to send uh, these messages to them first uh, before they would send them down to MISX. And they would check it and just see that it was done correctly and ready to go. And then they would put it back in the system and uh, NYPO would send it by airmail to the uh, Red Cross in Portugal. Now, Portugal is just one example. There were, Switzerland was used and at different times in the war, different paths here were used. So this is just a, an example of one that was used extensively early on. Uh, from Portugal, the I, uh, Red Cross had coordinated with Germany to have uh, POW mail flown to Lubeck, uh, especially for the air uh, camps, the uh, airmen, air, air force camps. From Lubeck, uh, it was transported by train to Stalag Luft 3 in Sagan, and that's where the censorship was done for all of the Stalag Luft uh, camps, the, the air force camps. So once it was done, it, it was distributed uh, by truck from Stalag Luft 3 to 1, 4, 2, etc. And the return was basically the same thing in reverse order, where they would go to Stalag Luft 3 for censorship on the way out, get to Lubeck, go over to Portugal, go back to New York. So it, it took a while. I mean, it was very reliable considering the circumstances, but it, it actually could take months to go one way. And when they're talking about uh, very strategic information, um, that's, that's very, very long. So um, it, it made things a little difficult, and that leads us to the radio codes. Uh, during 43, MISX first set up uh, the letter code communication system, but while it was doing that, it was also gathering information from the POWs about the viability of uh, receiving radio messages. Uh, radio components had been sent uh, by the British and the, the Americans, uh, and so very soon, by the end of 43, virtually every camp had a receiver of one sort or another. Um, the one on the right I'm showing here is actually a cribbage board uh, with a crystal set inside it. This, you'd use uh, metal pins and knowing where to put them, you would attach an antenna or headphones and, or a jumper for some coarse uh, tuning. Um, but they also had more traditional uh, radios that needed power and um, they, they would uh, stay up late at night and get a certain broadcast. The code section made special arrangements with the Office of War Information uh, to modify scripts for their new Voice of America news and propaganda broadcasts to conceal coded messages. Again, very few people there knew what was going on, but the way it would work is that there were an office uh, up there in the OWI that had a couple uh, non-uniformed MISX folks, and they would get a script and modify it and then give it back to the uh, OWI and they would uh, check it and broadcast it. And then the BBC would receive it and not knowing what they were doing, you know, what was in it, they would rebroadcast the programs every night at agreed upon time. This proved to be an extremely fast way to get information to the POWs. Uh, and then of course they had to write for the most part by letter back because there was no, they couldn't use transmitters because it was too easy for the Germans to, to find that. So there were transmitters in some camps, but they weren't used until the very end of the war. Here's a picture of a script um, and it has, they typically are in this yellow paper and they come with a, a white cover sheet and you see it says 930 underground and on the top 10-4. Uh, I typed it out here, just the first part of it, so you can see uh, what it looked like. And the announcer would say, and now report to the underground and there'd be some musical bridge and that would indicate the message was starting. And this particular message was, I mean, code was R2 and they used uh, Morse code uh, two syllables is a dash, one syllable is a dot, three syllables or more 
is a pause or a skip to the next paragraph if it's more than one. So here you have reports from the north is a dash dot dot dot, that's a B. Italian is a three syllable, so that's a space. Uh, front is alone between two three syllable words, so that's an E. And then that there is, or three dots is an S. And you get increasing patriot, that's more than one three syllable word in a row, so that means, okay, go to the next paragraph. Uh, there'd be a little bell indicating the beginning of each new paragraph, which was very helpful. This continues with a U and an R and an E. And so that is be sure. And if you go through the whole message, it says be sure where all work parties are at end. Meaning if there are some POWs out on a work uh, uh, assignment, uh, the people in the, in the camp should know where everybody is at, at all times, because at the end they might have to uh, gather them uh, when they're liberated. Uh, the code work in the camp was very difficult. Uh, you can imagine uh, with the uh, very, in some cases, very crowded conditions. Uh, here is a typical picture of, of barracks. Um, the, the different camps had different levels of sophistication to their escape and uh, coding effort. Stalag Luf III was among the largest and had been established uh, by the, the system had been established by the British, uh, so they had a hierarchy of, of who got to know about the codes and how they did the writing, and they had special people that would stand guard. Uh, Stog 2B is an opposite end of the spectrum. It had no code users at all until uh, MISX had to convince them in a very clever way that, that they should be using codes. Um, so th there's a wide variety, but uh, one thing that was common is they had to hide from the Germans and that was typically done. Somebody might get up on top of a bunk and look like he's reading a book and he's actually writing a, a code message letter and he'd have other people there watching to see that the Germans didn't get too close. Uh, on the right, uh, the far right, you see what is basically a headboard over a cot or bed and then to the left, it's a slightly different view of it. You can see the shelf that's shown there with the books on it is no longer there. And to the left, they've taken a board and peeled it off to the left, and you can see a homegrown radio. So you close that board back, and uh, it doesn't look like there's anything suspicious. But of course, you don't have the headphones sitting there, um, but they go through holes in the map that's on the wall, and that's how they can uh, tune and use the headphones and get the BBC broadcast and write down the, the messages. Um, uh, information exchanged both ways from MISX to X, there are a couple different categories. There's administrative matters such as uh, writing to Davidson with ID 42, or the message we just looked at was Howard using could. Uh, feedback on the information that was given is very important. So in this case, the camp gave information on a town called Posen, uh, and it was very helpful for an attack and well done. That kind of feedback is priceless. Um, the War Office, the War Department would be interested in very specific information, uh, like uh, chemical war research one place or another. They'd also offer advice on avoiding certain routes if they were being uh, escaping. And uh, very many of the letters were saying, like, break open all wooden articles in a parcel from Captain Brown's fake relatives. Uh, so this would uh, warn, th these letters had to go in a lot earlier than the packages so that they gave uh, enough warning. Sometimes the packages would show up without this kind of instruction and people wouldn't know whether to break things apart or not. And then sometimes things were put into clear like a radio and that was later in the war and very important to steal them before the Germans could see them. Going the other way, similar administrative matters and specific intelligence. Uh, I'll draw your attention to the uh, third one down. Report on downings was very important. Uh, this message here is actually the decoded message, even though it looks like code. And it's saying that Smith, the navigator for Barter in the 306 bombing group on May 24th was shot down. B means the target was bombed and A means it was shot down by flak. And a lot of these messages were very important for the army to, to learn. And then finally, of great importance also was saying uh, feedback like the B-17 emergency forward hatch was not working right and many couldn't get out. Or that the need a better signal for when the leader uh, is shot because in some cases the whole group followed the leader even though he was crashing. 
So that's uh, a very brief and fast summary. I'm sorry if it was too quick. Um, 10,000 or so US personnel were trained in the letter code. Uh, there has been no indication that I'm aware of to date that the enemy ever was aware of secret correspondence carried out by MISX for almost three years. Very valuable intelligence was provided by the POWs that helped end the war earlier than otherwise. And the continual disruptions by having the endless escape attempts occupied a great deal of the enemy's time and resources, which was extremely important. But perhaps most important was the effect it had on the morale of the imprisoned men whose valuable service, thanks to MISX, could continue from behind the barbed wire front. Uh, as an epilogue on the right is a picture of somebody from MISX destroying all of their materials. It was at the order of the Secretary of the Army. And so it is very hard to find anything written about MISX now uh, because most of it was destroyed at the end of the war. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm sure we'll have questions at the end. Um, next up will be Greg Nedved. All right, Greg, I think you're ready. Go ahead. I'm waiting for my slides. They're up. OK. Can you see them? No, I don't. Now I see them. OK. OK. Now we should be good to go. All right, sorry about that. Uh, it's early in the morning, uh, certainly for me. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Greg Nedved. I'm a historian for the Center for Cryptologic History, and I am delighted to be here uh, for this, uh, you know, this symposium, which we hold every two years. I hope everyone will be able to hear me, and perhaps more importantly, that they'll be able to see uh, the slides. This is actually my fourth or fifth uh, symposium, and it's that my second or third uh, presentation, I have talked about China before in past symposiums. I've also done Herbert Yardley. In fact, I think the last one that I gave was on Herbert Yardley. Okay, uh, so this is a relatively new topic, uh, brand new information um, for, for a lot of people. This You can consider this to be sort of a sneak preview, I suppose, for all of you. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and have the next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about Chinese cryptology during the Korean War, and I thought it wouldn't be a bad idea to uh, begin uh, with a little bit of a explanation of the Korean War. I understand that many of you are familiar with it already, but even so, it's never a bad idea just to do a little bit of an introduction, a little background to it. Basically, uh, what happened was in June of 1915, North Korea attacked South Korea in an attempt to unite the country under, uh, under a communist regime. They almost succeeded. United Nations forces led by the United States, and of course the commander was, was General was Douglas MacArthur, managed to push those North Korean forces out of South Korea. These UN forces drove well into North Korea itself, and they got pretty close to China. China at the time had just had a revolution, a new communist regime of its own, headed by uh, you know Mao Zedong, and uh, Mao decided, and he, you know, he took a risk here. This was not an easy decision for him to make to intervene 
with with forces, Chinese forces just came in and they drove the UN forces back actually into South Korea. Eventually those UN forces recovered and the remainder of the war would be a military stalemate pretty much with fighting pretty much around the 38th parallel, which is where, the, which was the pretty much the, the, the border when the war actually began. The big winner, I'd have to say, if, you, if, you, if you're looking in terms of winners here, would have to be Mao, who uh, successfully defended his uh, revolution, uh, successfully defended China because, you know, he had a lot to lose. He was fearful that these UN forces would go into China and basically throw out communism and remove him. Okay, so with that background, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, the United States is at war now with, uh, with, with China, with communist China, and we needed to know a lot about their cryptology. Pretty much everything we knew came from the nationalists who were on the losing side in the Chinese Civil War, the Chinese communists throughout the nationalists in the late 1940s. So pretty much everything we knew about Chinese cryptology came from the nationalists. But we really needed to know a lot more. We needed to have a real thorough understanding of, of the Chinese uh, communist the system of doing, uh, of, of, of code making, code breaking, et cetera. And we decided that would, the people who we really needed to talk to would be POWs, you know, uh, the Chinese uh, cryptologists who were POWs. Fortunately for us, in June of 1951, there was a huge influx of Korean, of, of POWs that were captured, Chinese POWs. So we surveyed them and we, when we identified roughly a dozen or so who had information that we felt could help us. And one in particular was, for lack of a better way of saying it, a godsend to us. His name was Joe Lin. And Joe, interestingly, was actually a uh, fingered or served up by his colleagues. You know, they would say, they would answer the American questions by saying, you know, with that kind of information, you know, we don't know the kind of person you want to talk to is that guy over there, Joe Lin. So he was served up by, you know, his colleagues. Joe um, was a peasant, you know, from North Central China, and he was not a particularly curious guy. He wasn't very, he wasn't particularly ambitious. He was one of those guys that just basically wanted to, you know, do his job, hope the war ends and go home. He was a reluctant as at first to help us. I think you can imagine why that might be, but eventually he came around and decided to be a lot more cooperative. Apparently we caught him in some inconsistencies a good interrogator will do that. And for, I guess he just decided he was better off playing ball with the Americans. So he eventually was sent to the United States. But Joe was just a wonderful source of information for us. Uh, probably next in line in terms of importance was Jerry Way. Uh, Jerry was not as cooperative as Joe Lynn was. Uh, I, I saw one document where we thought that Jerry was misleading us, but the two of them together were able in, in, in the long run to corroborate a lot of information that uh, we already had or suspected or that we got from other POWs. Then there was a Mr. X, who was a radio procedures uh, a specialist. He would go to the United States as well. Okay, uh, the two Chinese that are in the picture there in the left-hand corner, I don't know who they are. You know, they're not Joe, they're not Jerry. Uh, the person on the right is uh, Wash Wong, you know, one of the great uh, uh, language analysts in NSA history. He's in our Hall of Honor. Uh, Wash Wong would be Joe Lin's uh, interrogator, or uh, I'm sorry, a tr interpreter. And he's actually the guy that came up with the name Joe Lin. Needless to say, Joe Lin, Jerry Wei are not their actual names. These are names that were provided uh, to them for, uh, you know, for protection. And for some reason, we chose not to give a name to Mr. X. All right, next slide, please. Okay, I don't know if you can see this, so I'll just go ahead and read it for you. 
This comes from a September 19th, 1951 document, and this tells us about the value of Joe Lynn. What the document says, or what the, the, the blurb that I'm going to give you is, the interrogation of Joe Lynn has proven to be of exceptional value to AFSA operations. In fact, it has been estimated that the information which was freely and, and unhesitatingly given by source, in this case Joe, has saved AFSA one year's research on the Chinese communist cryptographic problem, or in terms of a monetary equivalent value, one quarter of a million dollars. Uh, in simple English, he saved us a lot of time and a lot of money. In case you're curious, uh, AFSA is the Armed Forces Security Agency. That was the predecessor of NSA, and it was composed of the Armed Forces uh, cryptologic components, uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force. The Army in particular was, was involved with the interrogation of these guys. Uh, Wash Wong, who I just mentioned, was, uh, with the arm, uh, with, was with the Army Security Agency. And one other thing I want to mention here, you see the reference to Chinese communists. You didn't see words or, or terms back then like China and PRC. It was Chinese communist, Chai Com, Ch uh, versus Chinese nationals, Chinat. So that's just the, uh, the, the terminology that they used back then. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. I don't know how many of you have ever seen this before. It's a standard telegraphic code or China or Chinese telegraphic code. That's another title for it. This is the system that China used uh, for sending, or the Chinese used, I should say, for sending um, uh, telegraph messages. And this was a system that was actually uh, developed for them by foreigners, by Westerners. Uh, in, in, in the 1870s, and they would continue to use this for decades. And, you know, who knows, they might even still using it now. I think it's pretty straightforward. I think you can figure out how this works. Basically, you know, if you want to send a Chinese character by telegraph, you used, uh, you send digits, and it's even, it was even cheaper to use letters. So this system would serve as the foundation for Chinese, uh, uh, for Chinese uh, cryptology for for decades, and it was used by the Chinese military, the you know themselves. Basically, uh, the encryption process that we learned from Joe was pretty straightforward. You know, you start with plain text, which was the you know the handwritten scribbled Chinese. Then you put it in code using a code book such as this. Then you would encipher it, which was the, which was the adding on additional numbers. Then you'd put it in some kind of a formula, and then you'd send it out. And then the other side would receive it and then reverse the process to, uh, to, de to, uh, uh, to decrypt the message. Let me give you a practical example of this. Next slide, please. Okay, and for the record, this is a made up example, but I just wanted to show you how it works. Uh, Ni hao ma is how are you in Chinese? So if nothing else, you're getting a you know, a Chinese language lesson out of this, I suppose. Okay, so the way it would work is suppose you want to send this message, Ni Hao Ma, you would have the, the code book numbers, the CTC or the STC, and those numbers, like I said, came from the code book. In the case of Ni, it's 0132. And then with Hao, it's 1170, and then for Ma, it's 0834. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. The next thing that you would do was you would use, you would take numbers from a key page or a keypad, and I'll be talking about that in a little bit. And then uh, you would uh, basically do uh, subtraction. And for the record, you didn't have to do subtraction. You could do addition, or I suppose multiplication, multiplication or division if you wanted to. But Joe was pretty adamant that his unit used, uh, uh, used subtraction. Basically, what you did was you subtracted uh, the first number from the second. And when and in the case of Nihao Ma, you'd get 7300-3294 and 0081. Those would be the digits that would be transmitted. And of course, the recipient would just simply reverse the process. And, and by the way, this is not uh, anything all that you know special. Lots of countries did it this way. 
So the Chinese here were no different, but they would do some things that, uh, you know, that were a little different or that we weren't necessarily had seen before. Okay, now let's look at this a little bit more carefully. If you do the, the subtraction, you may notice something. If you subtract 1170 from 4364, you do not get 3294, you get 3194. And similarly, if you subtract 0834 from 0815, you're gonna get a negative number. So how come you get 0081? Well, the answer is that the Chinese used non-carrying subtraction. That's how they got those numbers. Non-carrying subtraction basically was simply just, uh, you know, not borrowing from the column on the left when you're doing math. It's the, the way, the reason it was done this way, and the Chinese weren't alone in doing this, and you could do the same thing with addition, was basically just it was quicker, it was faster, it was less sloppy, and certainly, you know, you're also avoiding negative numbers this way too. So this is uh, the reason why you get 3294 and 0081. Okay, uh, I imagine some of you are probably doing the math right now. Uh, you know, feel free to check my math. That you're, 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 you're certainly welcome to do that. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the key. And that's what really made this system secure. The Chinese tended to use the same code book. So you're always going to have 0132, 1170, and 0834 uh, for the, you know, for the code numbers. But it all, but the key number was all, the key digits were always different. There's a thing called a one-time pad, and I'm sure that you're all aware of these. The, the, the basic idea here is you use, a, you know, you use these, these numbers once and then you throw them away. Uh, the Chinese were a little different. They tended to keep using the same keypads. The only thing was that they just never repeated the number. So in other words, you'd only see 7432 once. Next time you might see 4364, but it was from the same keypad. They just never repeated the exact same um, digits. And we wondered why the Chinese, you know, would print out these keypads, these key sheets, because they didn't print out a lot of stuff. But when we realized it's because they continue to use these sheets over and over again, it made more sense to us. Uh, we were amazed that Joe was able to perform the math so quickly. He did it in his head. So we asked him about his training and we wanted to know the whole process. Basically, you know, we asked him about his training, how he learned this. And basically, you know, as you can imagine, the type of training you'd get, addition, subtraction, stuff like that. One of the things that the Chinese were teaching their people was something called Peng Fa which I'd never heard of before, but it was basically upside down subtraction. That was one of the things that they were using uh, to train their people. Also, something called Fibonacci addition, which I suspect the math people, you know, in the audience are, are very familiar with. Fibonacci addition, F-I-B-O-N-A-C-C-I. -C -C -I. And rather than explain what it is, it's easier just to show you or to give you an example. One, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21. You take the, the previous two numbers and you add them together and it kind of goes from there. So these are the type of things that the, you know, that they, the Chinese were teaching, you know, there would be a cryptologist. Some of the other things that we learned from Joe and we really picked his brain, you know, what happens when you're sending a message if you make a mistake? Well, the way the Chinese did it was very simple and very smooth. Basically, they erased the mistake, they wrote in error, and then they proceeded on. And then at the very end of the message, and this would resemble footnoting, I suppose, they would have error one, and they would put in what it should be, error two, you know, what it should be. So it, that was a smooth way of doing it. It, it, it stopped the, you know, the messages from being confusing. Another thing that the Chinese did was that they would start off their messages by saying who you were, and then the recipient would be at the end. In other words, this is Joe, message intended for Bill. This is a little different, like for example, in, when we write a letter, you know, which we start off with dear, dear Susan, and then signed, 
you know, Kathy. So the Chinese kind of did it in a reverse way. You know, and these are just things, this is just the way the Chinese tended to do it. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next slide, please. Okay, cryptography with Chinese characteristics. Let me go over just some of the basics that we learned. We learned an awful lot from these guys. You can imagine Joe in particular. This was an efficient, even brilliant process, simple, practical. It employed a thought process different than what we uh, were used to. We, we tended to look at it from how the Americans would do it. Well, guess what? The Chinese don't do it that way. Okay. The Chinese recruited people with good memories. Zhou Lin being a case in point, they put a lot of thing to memory. And there's a couple things to keep in mind here. These people that they recruited were not necessarily well-educated. Zhou was a peasant. You know, he had a grade school education. Literacy was an issue. The Chinese tended to avoid manuals, unlike the Japanese who used a lot of manuals. The Chinese tended to avoid manuals, which made sense because, you know, if people can't read them, then why have them? You know, it makes sense from their perspective. Also, manuals are just another thing to lose. So the people they were looking for were not necessarily well-educated, but they had to have good memories. Another thing that was kind of interesting was that they sought out left-handers. This uh, traditionally uh, is, is very interesting in the sense that China has not really liked left-handers or they've, they've kind of you know, discouraged it because left-handed, you know, being left-handed apparently is, it's harder for you to write Chinese characters that way. So they sort of discouraged you if at all possible to, you know, not to use your left hand. But here, the Chinese uh, the communists, you know, the PRC are looking for left-handers for cryptology. And the reason for this, and I don't know how accurate it is, is that supposedly it offered a type of dexterity when you're manipulating, you know, the, the code books and things like this. I don't know how true that is, but apparently they believed it. All right, oddities. I already mentioned the fact that we were surprised that they would print out these key sheets or these, you know, these keypads. You would expect that there'd be an awful lot of indoctrinization. This is China in the early 1950s. You'd expect a lot of time would be spent on, on, on drilling into the heads of the trainees, you know, the virtues of communism, how wonderful Mao is, all this other kind of stuff. Not according to Joe. According to Joe, the indoctrinization was very minimal. The Chinese trained these guys for a job, and that was their main focus. The, uh, the indoctrinization was like secondary, so that was kind of interesting. Joe himself said that there were very few Communist Party members that he dealt with, actual members of the party. All right, next slide, please. Okay, uh, the nationalists. Everything that we knew for the most part about the Chinese communists came from the nationalists, you know, about their systems. A lot of nationalists defected to the communists at the end of the Civil War because, you know, the communists were winning, you know, morale was low, etc. A number of nationalist units defected. But this and this created a security issue for China or for, for the for the Chinese communists. In 1948, they underwent um, in an over a uh, a comprehensive communications uh, overhaul, a, a comprehensive overhaul of their communication system, of their communication system, because of all these nationalist units. So, how do you deal with security with these new nationalist units? Because the Chinese communists really didn't trust them. Well, one of the things that they did was they would, if they didn't want the the former, you know, the nationalist commanders to see a, a message, they would start off the message by with, with the Chinese character for party. In other words, if you saw that character, then it was intended only for certain units. It's similar, it's, a, it's sort of a, a no foreign or a five eyes type of, you know, eyes only type of system. So that Chinese character for party, Dong, at the beginning of a message indicated that the old nationalist units were not supposed to see it. A question that's been raised from time to time is how much a control the Soviets had over the Chinese during the Korean War, how much control the Chinese had over the North Koreans? Well, we got an answer from Joe. 
Uh, very little. Essentially, this was a Chinese show, you know, thus the name of the presenta uh, presentation, Cryptography with Chinese Characteristics. You know, it's a take on Deng Xiaoping's 1980s, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics slogan. There was very little uh, Russian influence on the Chinese, uh, you know, on the Chinese uh, code making process. You know, there were no Russian words, no Russian concepts. Uh, Joe himself said he never saw a single North Korean soldier when he was in when he was in South Korea. What's interesting here is that the Chinese had an approach of teaching it only one way. They didn't care who the opponent was. You were going to get the same training regardless of who you were fighting. These guys that were interviewed or that were not interviewed, but are, that were interrogated, they, you know, they knew nothing at all about American capabilities. It's a little bit like, you know, to talk, you know, pro football, you know, NFL, when you have, uh, you know, a team is, is targeting their opponent for the following week. They study up on that opponent. Not the, not these, not the Chinese communists. They didn't do that. It was the same training for everyone. So it really didn't matter who, who, their, who their opponent was going to be. So these guys knew nothing at all about our capabilities. They knew nothing at all about Soviet capabilities. The, the, the training was entirely functional. You learn your job and nothing else. The, the right hand only knew what the right hand was doing. I mentioned earlier that Joe was not a curious guy. He was not ambitious. You sort of get the sense that that's the way they liked it. That's that was what they preferred. You only knew your own job and nothing else. And that was, you know, that's a, a brilliant type of security because you're only going to get so much from a person. Nothing, only what they know and nothing else. Cryptography, the code writing was kept separate from the transmission. You know, that might be the room next door, but you had no idea what was going in that, going on in that room. All right, uh, no machines. In the 1920s, there was a cryptologic revolution in the United States. Prior to this time, we had, uh, you know, manual um, encipherment, you know, pens, pencils, things like this. And then, and then all of a sudden in the 1920s, we, we have the advent of machine generated ciphers. You know, you press a key, a wheel turns, another uh, key lights up. The Enigma machine, for example, is a prime example of machine generated ciphers. The Chinese had nothing like this. Now, this was not a surprise to us that they didn't have these kind of machines. You could have predicted this because, you know, these machines are technology heavy which China didn't have a lot of in the 1950s, or you have to maintain these machines. So it makes sense that the Chinese would not have these. But what surprised me at least was that they didn't even use an abacus. An abacus uh, is, a, is a counting machine. It's a calculating machine. And, and the Chinese could go really, really fast on these things. They're like computers. It surprised me that they didn't use these at all. But I guess thinking about it, you know, everything was done in their heads. And they like to keep things simple, so I guess it would make sense that they wouldn't use these either. Next slide, please. Okay. I think it's important to keep in mind that everything that we got from these guys was theoretical. They never gave us any actual codes. All we got from them was drawings and explanations. Another thing to keep in mind here is that, and this gets back to what I was saying, that they only knew their own jobs. We only learn about Chinese code making. We learn nothing at all from these guys about Chinese code breaking. How good were they at breaking our messages? We got no, we have no idea. We, or we learn nothing from these guys about that. Again, they only knew their own jobs. Did any of this actually help us in the Korean War? I would say no. It certainly helped us immensely in the long run, but it didn't help us in the war because the war would be over soon. One thing we did learn, which could have been beneficial on the battlefield, was that uh, the color of the cover of the code book mattered. A brown covered 
or brown colored uh, code book, for example, was of a higher level than a white one. So with that kind of knowledge, you could have been looking for brown colored code books. And then finally, whatever happened to these guys? Well, we really don't know. According to Wash Wong, uh, Joe Lynn, you know, basically just had a new life in the United States. He got married, he had a family, and he was under the, 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 the control or the watch, so to speak, of the CIA, what we would call nowadays witness protection. Eventually, I assume eventually that ended. Uh, the other guys, we just don't know. All right, uh, and then the final slide. Okay, the final slide is basically just saying I'm finished. So uh, this didn't take uh, as much time as uh, I was allotted. I guess that means more time for questions. So uh, at this point, I am done, and thank you all for staying uh, for staying with me. Great. Thank you, Greg. That was very interesting. Both of our um, discussions today have been very interesting, things I didn't know anything about. Um, the first question is for Peter, and someone asked, where were some of the main places where you found source material? I'm trying to unmute. <laughs> okay. We can hear you. You can hear me, okay. Yeah. Um, it's a variety of, of things. The Library of Congress has some materials. The, the National Archives has some materials that, that were partially declassified uh, in the 80s. Uh, in the mid 80s, a guy from MISX who worked with my father named Lloyd uh, Shoemaker uh, wrote a book called The Escape Factory. And you can still get that. It's uh, I think it's out of print, but you can, you can get it pretty easily. And that's a nice summary that that goes further into uh, the specifics of certain rat lines and and escapes. Uh, so yeah, it's been some stuff from, uh, I, there's an interview my father did in the 90s for the Army uh, that was uh, made available and um, other stuff basically I'm picking up in the, the British archives and the National Archives. Okay. I had a question. To, do we have any indication that um, the Germans or Japanese POWs um, tried a similar approach? It's a great question. Um, there was speculation of that, and I actually have a file from my father. Uh, he was, as sort of the head cryptographer there and cryptanalyst, he was not just writing codes and managing some of that, but he was also looking, in particular, there was a, a German prisoner of war at MISY, that they were suspicious that he was using some kind of a code message uh, system writing home. And I haven't gotten into that folder of stuff from my dad yet, but he was clearly tasked with looking into whether they possibly were using the same system. It, if so, I believe the conclusion is it was very spotty and not a formal organized effort. And I don't know about the Japanese at all. They, they uh, um, I'm not aware of any suspicion that they were using a system. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions, although I I still have some, so I'll I'll keep asking them. Um, Greg, um, the Japanese were also using code books around this, you know, in World War II. Uh, China, as you talked about, was using code books. Was there a reason? I mean, did they attempt at any time to, to use mechanical systems or um, was there a reason why these seemed particularly um, appealing to them? Uh, are you talking about China? Well, I'm talking about China, but I, I was thinking too about it seemed like there were other places in, you know, in Asia and, and around there that it seemed to use code books too. So, I mean, I guess oh, I am. Okay, let me address the question about the use of, you know, the machine generated uh, uh, ciphers by the Chinese, why they didn't use them. Yeah. 
there's a couple of reasons. Um, basically, technology. Now they did have German advisors. That's you know, right. in the years leading up to uh, World War II, and the Germans, you know, it certainly had the Enigma machine, but the Germans were not going to be giving Enigma machines to the Chinese. Uh, you know, you know, you have to have like an exchange agreement and things like this, and it just wasn't a good idea for the Germans to do this. They were watching. They were watching very carefully, monitoring their, you know, the the use of their Enigma machines, who got them, things like that. Also, in the terms of the nationalists, there was a man by the name of Dai Li, who was the overall head of Chinese intelligence during during the Chinese during the during World War II, and he was basically he ran the show, and he really was not interested in machine generated ciphers. They they liked the code books. That's just what they liked to use. So it was just something that was just sort of ancient or, or alien to their way of looking at it. All right, thank you. Um, Peter, I had another question about, um, you talked about how the, um, the British shared their system um, with us and can you talk a little bit, do you know more about that relationship? How did that develop? Um, Certainly. Um, I, I'm trying to remember who, I think it might have been John Starr or, or somebody in, in, who ended up being a, a player in uh, MISX visited the British and um, was very impressed when they gave him a briefing on what MI9 was doing. This would be in uh, early 1942. And so he came back impressed and asked the uh, I believe it was he asked the Army, Air Force, and Navy to uh, evaluate, uh, go to England, learn more about it. The only one who did was Ed Johnston uh, from the Air Force, and he stayed there for a summer or a, couple, a month or so, and he came back uh, convinced we needed to do this. And it took some convincing of, of higher level officers to, to approve it, but once it did, uh, MI9 sent a guy named Leslie Winterbottom over to visit uh, MISX, and he was the head of their code effort. So he would, his counterpart was my dad's boss, Creighton Churchill. So Winterbottom came. I actually found a handwritten uh, outline that he was suggesting be used for the monthly reports, and sure enough, they used it, that outline. Uh, he taught number four to the U.S. in February of 43, and that's when it started being distributed. Uh, and uh, he also visited a couple people doing some training to advise on how how to do the briefing um, to others who would then go out and, and brief the servicemen. So uh, and, and then that continued. It was a pretty close liaison. There was actually a liaison office in D.C. for the for the MI9 folks. And you know th there was some friction back and forth. There's always some uh, Anglo uh, U.S. Uh, friction, uh, <laughs> especially in some of the accounts you read. Uh, but overall, it was remarkable how how well they got to get, got along together and and helped each other. Thank you for that. Um, Greg, um, can you talk a little bit about? Um, you said that their you the use of the um, I guess it would have been Chinese nationalists or Chinese prior to the um, the communists coming in um, had been using code books for since the late 1800s. How did that start? What did they have advisors or how did that process begin? Yeah, uh, it was uh, started by um, Europeans. A Dane, actually, and a, Fr and, and, and a Frenchman were among the earliest ones to come up with the system. It all had to do with the invention of the telegraph and the expansion of the telegraph to China. And this is a way of just improving commercial uh, dealings. And all, a lot of countries were faced with this problem. You know, they don't have a Romanized language. 
So they had to come up with the system of sending telegraphs. You know, the Japanese had the same problem. You know, the Arabs had the same one as well. I mean, you know, if you, you have to send numbers or letters. And if you don't have that script, then you have to come up with the system. But this system was invented for the Chinese uh, by, uh, by Westerners. And just let me say this too, while the Chinese kept using code books, they changed the code books. They came up with all kinds of interesting formulas. So I, 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 you have the standard telegraphic code. Most of them were based on this, but they would come up with different numbers and different formulas, but it was still heavily code book based. Thank okay. you. My attempt at an answer? Yes. Um, as a follow up to that, um, later on, was there any was there any um, involvement? I was thinking about your work on Yardley. Was Yardley or any Westerners in there, like in the World War, the interwar period, or even maybe World War II time frame? Uh, to help the Chinese nationalists with their cryptology? Well, Herbert yeah. Yardley was brought on. Uh, okay. Diley, the guy that I mentioned, brought on Yardley. Okay. Uh, because Yardley was available. You know, he had some expertise that they needed. And uh, the Chinese really didn't like to use foreigners for, you know, for stuff like this. As, you know, they, they minimized it as much as possible because, you know, it's a matter of trust, things like this. This was a time period, you know, when they were nationalist. They were nationalistic and, you know, with the, with the China, China wants to do it itself but they recognized that they needed some help. I don't know of any foreigners in the 1920s and 1930s that were helping the Chinese develop their codes. Okay. I really don't. Not off the top of my head. All right. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I had another follow-up question. This one's maybe a little bit more personal, but what, what information did you get from your father or, or what what kind of things did he share with with you about his wartime service? When I was very young, he he shared an interest in codes. He gave me Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug, and, and that had actually started him off when he was nine, and I got very interested in it. And I knew that he worked uh, uh, over in Alexandria and that he had something to do with codes, but he didn't, certainly as growing up, he didn't go much further than that. Um, it was in the 80s when some of the material was declassified that Lloyd Shoemaker started uh, contacting my dad. And I have some really interesting correspondence between my dad and Lloyd. My dad was very clever not to share too much, but he would hint at the right direction. So he directed Lloyd to certain people that he knew were still around and how to get a hold of them. And, and Lloyd did a great job. Um, he, and I even went to dinner with Lloyd and my dad. And, and this other guy once and, and could, could hear them discussing what was going on. But um, they all signed an oath and I actually have a copy of my dad's signature on an oath saying that they would never talk about the details of what they're doing. And it never said until somebody says it's OK or until, you know, you're 90 years old or whatever. It just so to this, you know, Shoemaker it was at the right time to get a lot of people that were still around who had been in the war and part of this activity. And a lot of them would not talk to him because they signed the oath. And my dad was hesitant to share too much because he signed the oath. And then the, the army came in 1994 and wanted to interview dad and a couple others that were still around, a uh, very uh, secret interview, a cl classified interview. And he wouldn't do it until he got some letter from the highest person he could get in the army saying it's okay to do it. And even then I watched it recently, he shares, uh, a lot of what I had in here about the overview, but but he doesn't go down in, into the details. Um, and then in 19, right before he died in 2006, the National Park Service, who owns the Fort Hunt land now, had realized what their what went on there, and so they had a uh, gathering of the remaining veterans who worked in either MISY or MISX, and the, the Army gave little medals to uh, each of them. I, I, my dad was too ill to make it down there, so I received that for him. 
and then that's that's when there was more publicity about uh, what went on. Uh, but he was, you know, I I would love to ask him a couple questions now, especially that I started doing the research after he died in 2008, and he could answer so many of these questions right away. But he's long gone, I'm afraid. So I'm still digging and trying to put the pieces together. Wow. Yes. Uh Thank you for that. Uh, Greg, we have a question um, from the audience and it says, I had heard that the Chinese nationalists recovered Imperial Japanese Army coding machines when its Kwantung Army surrendered in Manchuria. If this is true, did the Chinese nationals or the Chinese communists utilize this coding machine technology at all? Huh, good question. Uh, I would say they tried to use it as best they could. I'm sure that they had China, Japanese POWs that uh, they forced to help them use it, but I don't think it was widespread yet. It was uh, just uh, kind of too late to basically save the nationalists. Presuming, of course, that this, this material was... Uh, continue to be used by the nationalists. The communists may have gotten it too. If I understand it, the communists got this from the nationalists when they, they captured it. Is that is that what the, the question was? Well, I guess the question is, did Chinese nationalists recover Japanese army coding machines? And, and if they did, did they use them? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I think they tried to use them as much as possible. Okay. There were some efforts made at this time to develop their own uh, machine generated ciphers that would really take off for China after the, you know, after uh, World War II. I think mostly in this case, it was just them learning them and having the Japanese probably at the, you know, at the barrel of a gun telling them how they work. My guess is that they used them a little bit, but you know, they really didn't uh, use them thoroughly because they didn't understand them enough. Yeah, that makes sense. Really a good question. Um, I don't think you addressed this, but it seems surprising to me that um, the Chinese communists would use a very similar system to the Chinese nationalists. Wasn't there any concern that like somehow they would be compromised or? Um, I mean? Actually, that's not surprising at all. Okay. I mean, you know, they're, they're Chinese. They're going to look at it the same way. What the Chinese communists really did was they just modified existing systems they modified them to their own uh to their own way of doing it this is why we needed to find out more if we you know if they kept exactly what the nationals had then we wouldn't have needed to talk to these pow's i see i mean you know it's uh it's still chinese they're they're not going to change it completely they're just going to adjust it to their own needs so it made perfect sense to me that the communists would use a system similar to the nationalists. They would just tweak it to their own uh, specifications. Plus, who are they going to use as a model otherwise? They didn't really have, they weren't taking cryptologic advice from the Soviets. They weren't taking cryptologic advice from anyone. Yeah. So that wouldn't surprise me at all. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a question for Peter from uh, John Wilcox. Um, what types of information did the POW share with MISX using that the the code? Uh, it was uh, a variety. They had information that I characterize as administrative, where they're saying. OK, we taught this new code user or this code user is here who has knows this code. He's going to use number 15 as his code. And so registering new code users was important. 
they would also ask MISX for things like if they wanted a 220 volt um, piece for a radio, they would ask for it. Um, they would stay uh, a very important category of the messages back home was how different uh, uh, crews were downed, whether it was by flak, uh, by other fighters, uh, by some other malfunction. And uh, I, I, I talked about this one long uh, answer that, that said so-and-so, who was the navigator for so-and-so bomber group 306. That kind of message was, there were a lot of those, uh, and that was very useful to the, uh, the Army to know, for the Air Force to know uh, how these things were failing, how they were getting shot down. Uh, they also uh, would talk about um, whether, uh, you know, they would answer questions from MISX on specific intelligence, like, rumors that there was some chemical warfare near Bujan or something like that. And the POWs would write back and say that whether they'd, they'd heard of that or not. Uh, so it was uh, almost anything uh, that was useful to the war office, the war department. Oh, and one thing I did mention in the talk is uh, a very good example is that the uh, front emergency hatch on the B-17 bomber was was locking up and, and people couldn't get out of it easily. And so that, that feedback came back pretty early and I, I'm pretty sure that the Air Force made a change to the planes after that to, to help. And then of course the last one I mentioned was uh, they have to have a signal that uh, the leader of a, of a group was shot because there were cases where everybody followed him thinking he was just flying a certain way but it turned out he was shot and going down and they all followed him i don't think they all crashed but that could be a very very dangerous situation so uh all of these things are things that the pow can learn uh they also learned info by bribing the german guards pretty extensively and uh, if they learned that the morale was bad or if they learned what the strengths of the Germans were at the camp or if it changed or something like that, that information would go back. So it was a pretty steady stream of info of anything they were learning. Wow. All right. Well, I think that is our final question. Um, I would just like to uh, thank both of you again. Um, and I look forward to hopefully um, seeing more about these topics uh, as your research progresses. Um, thank you to all the attendees. If you have any questions afterwards, uh, you know, let us know, contact us, and uh, we'll get those out to the presenters. But thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Jesse. Thank, thank you. you.